Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, Father, we have come together as your children by means of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, for your faithfulness. We thank you for your word that reveals to us who you are, who we are in Christ, how we are hidden in Christ as he is hidden in you, and that you will never leave us or forsake us. We pray, Lord, as we continue in your word, that we have a better understanding of who we are in you, that we would know you more deeply, more intimately. And Father, as we serve in your word this morning, we pray that you would reveal to us the truth that we need to know as you continue to begin, continue the work you have begun in us, Lord, that we would grow in your life. We thank you, Father, for this time and that's what you would bless you. Yes, it's what you would bless you. This morning, quite simply, we're going to have another conversation about the gospel. Um, I said as much last week, if you get me started on it, I could do it every week, and we, we're getting on that path. Hopefully every week will some greater understanding of the good news of our God and the work of Christ is heard from this pulpit for it ought to be because there is nothing, any, no message of Scripture which is outside of the good news and redeeming work of Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is a good topic to have at hand. This is also something that we will, though preaching through the gospel, be continuing through our text Evidence that what I just said is true, that no portion of Scripture is outside of the gospel of Christ will be seen and made evident by that simple fact. Now, I do want to say one thing. It has not, nothing to do with proper placement in the sermon. It has everything to do with the pastor not wanting to forget one thing he wants to say. And so I'm going to say it now, and I'll let us all work through it, and hopefully the sermon will make it clear. The gospel of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is for the redeemed. The good news of Jesus Christ, our Lord, is for the redeemed. When you speak of the redeemed, oftentimes we think of the redeemed as, I'll use a few church phrases, as the found, as the saved, right? Right? What I've tried to express last week is that's not always the case. And when we use those words and just those words to describe it, we can often lead to us placing ourselves as the judges of who the redeemed are, rather than understanding the sovereignty of God and his work amongst the lives of the redeemed. Did you know that God is working in you as his redeemed, even when you're not clinging to God? Did you know even in your rebellion, God has a work that he is doing within each of us? You see, these truths, though they go against everything we think in the flesh and how it ought to work, because the flesh thinks of merit, though they go against everything in the flesh, are the very things which make the gospel of Jesus Christ the gospel of Jesus Christ by which we, the redeemed, say, by grace alone. By grace alone. So, the gospel is good news, and the next question is, well, who is it good news to? And the answer would be the redeemed. The redeemed. Now, I hope that gets clarity this morning. And when I say that, I'm not just speaking of those who are so-called found or so-called saved. One of the greatest things of, of preaching the gospel from the pulpit for me or sharing the gospel is I never know when I'm going to come across a beloved brother or sister in the Lord. And what is revealed when somebody gives testimony that, yes, I do believe and I confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord, my Redeemer and my Savior, though they have never confessed that before. The truth that is made known in my spirit and in their spirit is that they were beloved by God from before the foundations of the world. 
Can you imagine that? When you're praying with somebody confessing who Christ is, they're confessing something, but that doesn't make them something that they previously weren't. They're confessing and recognizing what God has made known unto them. That he has for long, since long ago, loved them as his own. What a glorious gospel and what a joy it is when you are there and able to witness a new brother in the Lord see for the first time, I have a loving father. Or a sister in the Lord see for the first time, I have a protector and a redeemer who has always loved me and shall always love me. I see that. And each of you give testimony to it in your spirit, don't you? You have that moment where you specifically remember or those times that you remember the newness of God coming upon you. God wasn't new then, but an understanding was. And that, my friends, is a spirit and word bearing fruit within you. A testimony that the flesh cannot give, but the redeemed cannot help but celebrate. That's the gospel. So that's what I don't want to forget to say this morning. And hopefully it'll come together nicely as we go through the message. Our text is ultimately going to be verse 31 and 32. But I want to prepare our minds by going a little bit through what we went through last week. To do that, if you remember, verse 14 starts with another, the kingdom of heaven is or is likened unto a man who traveled into a far country, and he calls his own servants, if you remember this, and he delivered unto his servants his, his goods. So the goods belong to the man who's traveling, the master of the servants. He's going to give to one servant five talents, another two, and another one. Every man according to his ability. Now, if you recall from last week, The one that receives five talents is going to go and he's going to trade with the same and make another five talents. And then the one who received two is going to go gain another two. But the one who received one is going to go dig in the earth and hide his Lord's money. Now, when the Lord, the master comes back, he's going to ask each one what they did with it. And the two earlier ones that made something of it are going to come to the master and present what they did. And he say, is going to say, so much as well done, good and faithful servant. You're faithful in little. Now you'd be faithful in much. It's not going to be dependent on how much they're given in the first place or how much they were given later. There's going to be something else that I hope we're going to see. The third hit it. And what we become aware of is the reason that he hit it. And I said so much as... You could translate it, I know that you, Master, are a crook, that you're hard, that you're wicked, that you take what's not yours. And so he hides it for that purpose, to give it back when the Master comes. Now, we have spent much time clarifying the context that the parable of the kingdom, I don't see it as a parable of the church, but I do see appropriate application. And that's what we're going to spend much of our time in today, but I think it's going to be very illuminating of the parable itself and kind of lead nicely into verse 31 and 32. One might note that a distinction must be made here between the kingdom and that of the church, and that distinction must be founded that the entrance to the kingdom is found or appears to be founded by something that they do, which isn't the case for us. And I was going to build off of that thought this morning, but I'm not, I'm not certain that I want to. I want to offer you another thought. And I wonder here if the distinction is actually something that is true in every age, meaning whether or not we're talking about church age or kingdom age. And that distinction is actually not what they do, but who they are proven to be. 
when I was studying the text this week, it became more apparent to me that the contrast that is made is not what they do, but who they are. I agree that a member of the body of Christ could never be told that they must go to outer darkness where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This truth, however, is built on the fact that the redeemed hold their identity in Christ. However, there's another truth I want to offer to you to this morning, then that truth is whatever age we're speaking of, that age points to Christ. And the hope of every age is the redemption of Christ Jesus, their Lord. Whether it is the promise of his coming for redemption, the work of his redemption, or us as we remember the work of his redemption, each one, each work, is pointing to our need and his fulfillment. So there are those in every age which are of Christ. I say that even though I do also confess that I do see some distinctions in text, but again, I encourage you to be mindful we're going into application here. According to Christ in Matthew 13, you have good seed and you have bad seed. And he's speaking of Israel there. You have sheep and you have goats. It appears that what is made evident by the harvest or by the tarrying of the master is the same in each of his likenings of the kingdom. What is made evident as the harvest is allowed to grow with the wheat and the tares blended in together is that at the harvest, they're going to be separated and identified. Not that the seed ever changed what the seed was, but that there was a planter who planted good seed and another planter who came along and planted bad seed. And the owner of the farm said, let them grow together. And in time, in the harvest, there will be a sifting. The fact that there is good seed and bad seed, sheep and goats, righteous and wicked, is a fact that the scripture does not shy away from. What is not made in our text or in any of the kingdom parables is a distinction between the righteous and the righteous. That's what struck me this week. There's no higher tier type distinction made. You don't have the good righteous and the bad righteous the better righteous, or anything like that. Think about that. Why would there be not any distinction between the righteous? Could it be perhaps because we are all made righteous in Christ, and thus, therefore, there is now no distinction? It is his righteousness that becomes us. We are made, in other words, our identity is the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus our Lord, according to 2 Corinthians 5.21. This brings us back to understanding God's words of grace. So we started on words of grace last week. And these words of grace have to do with properly surveying the cross. And these words are specifically with surveying the cross. I tried to make apparent last week that when we discuss salvation, we discuss a work that is taking place and that is given unto the believers. You don't have to live as weighed down and in bondage and chains to the world. You are delivered from it even though you live and dwell in it. You are made able to abide in Christ through this life. You are saved. That salvation comes through the means of redemption reconciliation and propitiation, propitiation rather. So that work, and that's what I want to look at this morning. I want us to go back to surveying the cross. When we speak of being found in Christ and our identity and the new birth being found in the finished work of Christ, we are speaking of a effectual, and children, that means something was done that is actively affecting us, that has affected us and is actively affecting us. So the effectual work of Christ Jesus our Lord is what we're speaking of, 
and it's described in scripture utilizing different words. Again, this is, it sounds like an elementary point. God has used words to speak to us. Therefore, disciples, let's observe the words. And it's amazing the depths of his wisdom. That first word redeemed or redemption, if we go back again to the Greek, which we don't need to this morning, but if we were to understand these into why God used different Greek words in explaining this or in scripture, why he would utilize different words, we would find these truths. Redeem speaks of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ as far as sin is concerned. Sin, the problem with sin has been taken care of. So when you say redeemed, you are saying you are free. There is now no longer any punishment, any, any weight over you or the penalty of, for the penalty of sin, right? You have been redeemed. When we go into reconciliation and say by the cross we have been reconciled, we are speaking of the finished work of Jesus Christ as far as man is concerned. Whatever happened on the cross there with Christ, though we were once separated, we, the redeemed, have been made reconciled to God. Though we were blind and fully depraved and unable to even recognize our need, our minds, our hearts, our thoughts have been reconciled so at the proper time, God might reveal himself unto us. So sin taken care of, us reconciled in our ability and understanding and propitiation speaks of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ as far as God is concerned. To simply put it, his wrath has been satisfied. So we have each of these, a you call it a trinitary or a trinity effect of the description of the work of surveying the, cr the cross. This is a basic understanding of it. But each of these are descriptive in some regard of the character of your master and thus your place in him and his means of work in you. Now, I say it that way because the description of the kingdom that we've just looked at has to do with the character of the master and his servants' understanding of their place in him, right? So the reason, the applicable reason for me, the pastor, to preach the gospel to the church is that you might understand or be renewed in your thought of the goodness of the character of your God and your place in him. When the master returns in the parable we looked at last week, what is revealed about the servants? Isn't it, as we said before, who they are? And isn't this made evident who they are by how they view the master? I don't think it's an accident that Christ goes into describing the description of the servants upon his return in regards to, him, to himself or the master. The one who buried the talents, for example, saw the master as wicked and thus what did he prove? I want to offer to you that he proved himself to be wicked. I want you to think about this. Who, thinking doctrinally, looks at God and judges God, has the audacity to judge God in such a way as to say he takes what is not rightly his. And he is a hard master. Love is not in him. But he takes it. Who? Doctrinally, would you say that is representative of? Could we say Satan? And what I'm offering you here would be the goats, the children of Satan. And that's who that's representative of in your parable. On the other hand, you have those who see the master and the grace that all that they have are of him anyways. And so when he returns, he gives, they give him not just all that he gave them in the first place, but anything else that was of any profit is given back to the master. 
because it's all his. And who is that descriptive of? The children of God. Those who know the goodness and the grace and the sovereignty of their Lord. And I would argue that's applicable to every age. Now, I also think that unto the beloved of Christ, there's another appropriate lesson here, that whatever talents or whatever lot you've been given, it's been given to you by God. As a matter of fact, whether you like it or not, your position in life is a gift from God. Your spot, your lot. There's a principle of providence here. Providence is simply a word used to describe the provision of God in all things. So when I say providence, it's a belief that the hand of providence is over all things. I don't believe in luck. I don't believe in chance. I believe in providence. But the hand of God is over all. He is a good God and he is sovereign. And there's a lesson of providence here. And those who believe a, such a principle of providence are made able to rest in it. And they rest in the understanding of their lot and their life as being that is given by God. And in that are made able to have peace and joy. Now, there's a flip to that, which takes place even in the lives of believers. And that is that providence stops somewhere short of your lot in life. And that what you've been given in life is not something that is utilized as a means of worshiping God and that that's what you're called to, but that your lot in life is given, okay, by God, now make much of it for me, or I don't like my lot in life, so I'm going to change it for me. And I'm, I'm trying to say in such a way that you can see the distinction. God, you've put me here. Why? How would you like me to invest? And the flip is, God, you've put me here. Why? What were you thinking? Let me go fix it. That's the distinction I'm trying to make here. The two saw what the Lord had given them and worked with what the Lord gave them. That was multiplied. But according to the parable, if you would, even that which was multiplied, they give to the master. And then what happens? The master gives them more. What was ever earned by them? Nothing. Nothing. What was made evident by them was a proper understanding and a worship of their master. So if you, on the negative hand, view your life as a lot that you don't care for or you just want to change or you think you can do a certain work for, then your life will quite simply be a constant battle for a different lot. And that's what it's going to be because it's going to be what God has called it to be. The question at hand is whether or not you're going to know peace and the salvation of God is the redeemed of God in this life. Ultimately, ultimately, congregation, what is made evident to me here is that the important question at hand is how do you view the Lord of all? And when I'm sharing the gospel with somebody, it's about as simple as that. The Lord Jesus Christ is a good Lord. Our Heavenly Father is a perfect God and He is sovereign. And if they say amen, I know only the Spirit can show that. I don't need to see any other evidence. An amen to the truth of who Christ is. Only the redeemed of Christ can confess. God knows the sincerity of the heart. So, the question is, who do you see the Lord of all as? What do you see the nature of his character as? Then look at your lot in life. Is how you, how you see and view your life, is that consistent with how you view the character of your Lord? Do you believe that his purpose is good and well with you? Do you believe that he is working out something within you, that he started a good work and he will see it through to completion? Whether right now you're looking at something in life and it's a storm, it's a struggle, it's a time that you don't know how it could be seen as good. I could put it this way. 
Do you agree that whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well with my soul? Do you agree with such sentiment? So our lesson is that God has placed us where we are, and in so doing, he has called us, again, according to Romans 12, he has called us to a life devoted to him, a life invested in him, not to multiple masters, but to him alone, because it is his in the first place. It's a life of worship, a life of devotion, and is exercised by means of what he has given. This is the life of the redeemed. The redeemed are those who are identified in Christ Jesus, in the work of Christ, and thus they are the righteousness of God. Now with that in mind, we come to verse 31, prepared to discuss the return of the king. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and all the holy angels with him, then he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. This is if you would, in my understanding, a text which brings with it a great picture. We are in our context in the midst of Passion Week. It's the last week of Christ's earthly life before his death and resurrection. And the text has allowed us to follow him since he entered Jerusalem. And you've already heard him proclaiming to the disciples why he must come to Jerusalem. So we should be in the same question mark as the disciples when he's proclaiming what he's proclaiming here, given what he's just proclaimed as his purpose of coming here to be. The Son of Man is going to be falsely accused in two days. The mob will cry out, crucify him. Pilate will deliver him to the soldiers, and Christ will be crucified on the cross, hanging, and in the eyes of the public, seen as a criminal in two days. And yet here he says, when the Son of Man shall come in his glory. Well, let's break it down. First, he says, when the Son of Man. The Son of Man is a title that he's always used for himself, and so he's clearly speaking of himself here. Secondly, Christ gives a statement of fact. When the Son of Man, number one, when. Number two, the Son of Man shall come in his glory. He doesn't say if or possibly. He says when and shall. He's speaking of a coming reality. So we have a statement of fact. When the Son of Man shall come in his glory. And we have a condition that we know of in our context. Namely, that he is about to die seen as a criminal. Two opposing things that appear in our hearts and minds and sights and every part of our flesh to be completely opposite. Would you agree? That you imagine being the disciples at the time trying to work these things together? I would argue that the natural flesh of man would go, I'm just going to dismiss the other, what he just said. I really like that. So I'm going to hold on. He's finally changed his mind, and we're going forward with this thing. We're conquering, and he's about to rule and reign in Jerusalem. Usually that's how I would kind of picture that hearing this. They're like, finally, this is what I'm talking about. Let's do it. So we have something that looks conflicting. The all-powerful God is about to be seen as a criminal and yet is giving a statement of himself coming in glory. So we see the Son of Man shall come in his glory, and yet about to die a criminal. We see that as opposite. And what I'm trying to get to this morning is that the gospel of Christ, or what takes place on the cross, is the greatest demonstration of the sovereignty of God that we have in the text of Scripture. And the reason that it is that is because of what we just witnessed as being completely contrary in our understanding as to how something ought to work. Sure, we know it, and rightly so, the work of Christ on the cross is the greatest act of love. But I ask you to be honest in your understanding with me for just a moment. Is that the greatest act of love because Christ accidentally found himself faced between a rock and a hard place and decided to give up? Or did he come willingly in all sovereignty, ready 
to lay his life down. That's what makes it the greatest act of love. The all-powerful God humbled himself by his own sovereign will to the point of death, and death even by means of the cross. Now, we need to pause here because the powerful illustration here is that the greatest exercise of God's power is where he conquered sin once and for all, which to our flesh appears as everything as to the opposite of what power should be demonstrated as. And yet it is the most powerful work of God when we discuss him upon that cross and what to humanity is the most shameful state. I can't help but not note that that very same truth of God is made evident in our lives, especially in times of struggle. The greatest power of God that is witnessed in the life of the redeemed is when they have to confess, whatever my lot, whatever my lot. Because it's at that point, the flesh is made able to confess, I have nothing to gain. I have nothing to offer. There is no hope in myself. Whatever becomes of me is only by the means and the power and the grace and the goodness of God. And yet we sit so often in times in which the world looks and says, what goodness? And Satan himself laughs at us and says, you fool, you still call God good? And the spirit within us say, yes. And right there, we worship. That's the gospel. The only reason you say yes then is because of Christ's work on the cross. We don't even grip onto that and say, look how good I am. But we say, thank you, God. You drew near to me when I had only one thing to say. God is good. What a testimony of his work and his faithfulness. Can you imagine being the disciples here, hearing now of Christ saying he'll come in his glory, only two days later to be confronted with Christ dead in his tomb? If God is sovereign, if Christ is the Lord, then Christ knows what he's doing. But if our eyes are our discernment, if our human experience or surrounding circumstances define us, and boy, how quickly we become a lost, confused people. What's going on becomes a cry of the believer rather than God is good. I tell you that Christ speaks here with absolute authority when he says he shall come in his glory and with the holy angels. That's an absolutely true statement. And it's absolutely true that when he comes, he will, he shall sit upon the throne of his glory. And all nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate one from the other as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. The most important thing here is, does Christ know all who belong to him? That's your doctrinal statement for the morning. And I would answer with an affirmative, yes. He knows everyone that has been given to him of the Father and of each of those he is willing to lose. No, not one. Now, if I could just close with this. We often go back to, well, then what will I, must I do? And I have tried to offer in this church that the battle with the believer is not a battle of free will, but is rather a battle of worship, a renewing of the mind, understanding that the flesh has its cravings and the Lord has given you a new man. And which one are you going to feed? Are you going to feed the reality of what is? The new man is the reality. Nothing's going to rob that new man away. Nothing. That new man is unable to sin. And God sees you in terms of the new man, right? That's, that's where that reconciliation comes in. Sin is taken care of. That's where the propitiation comes in. God sees you not in wrathful light, but through the Son as abiding in Him. 
So that is good and glorious. Our question is, do we understand the reconciliation of God that we are made to come before him? So it's not a question or a battle of free will, because I would offer that if you were to take words and really break it down, free, word, free will is a nonsense word to begin with. I have discussed this with some, and I've had some say, well, free will is exactly what Satan has been trying to rob from us since the beginning, and I, I could not see that as far from, from the truth. Free will is not what was given, nor anything else in the garden in sin. Nothing of such was given in the garden. What happened in the garden was death became us in the garden. And I want you to understand this because this hits on these three words and the work of the cross. If you want to know the wonder of the cross, understand this. We, because of what took place in the garden, being gods were separated. If you would, we were locked in the casket of the flesh and separated from God. That is literal death. Death is separation. When one dies, what happens? They don't cease to exist. What is the pain and the sadness and the heartache that we feel? It's separation. The word death is trying to describe the separation that you feel when you can not get back to it. When it says make death of sin, it is make yourself separate of sin, seeing the new man that you are. And in the garden, we were made separate from God. It's not a ceasing to exist. We didn't cease to exist to God. We were separated. It's a certain separation. But God, and this is where the gospel comes in, has made us alive. Reconciled us. In Christ Jesus our Lord. That's the work. We were literally dead, separated. No means, no way back, but only the wisdom of God. Only the glory of God, the love of God, the grace of God. So that now, knowing ourselves to be the redeemed, knowing the goodness of the character of your master, How will you spend your life knowing of his certain return? To each of the hearts and minds of the redeemed, it ought to be a worshipful response of, it is his. God, use me as you will. May we work it out with fear and trembling, if it is anything else. Amen. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, your gospel is good. And though we read here of a time and an age of people that you are working with, we understand your truth as reaching throughout every age. That each one of your redeemed will be in your presence and will know the goodness of your glory. And whatever age or time we are in, we are all found to be in Christ Jesus. So, Father, I pray this morning you would affirm and complete this gospel message to your beloved, your redeemed. Strengthen them. Encourage them. Let them see your glory in times of struggle. Let them see your glory in times of which they feel as though perhaps they have turned from you, but yet you have not turned from them. Let them see your glory in seasons of praise and the goodness of the Master. And most of all, let them see your glory as that which is not dependent on circumstance, but your wisdom which reigns over and above to bring us to the light of your glory, whatever that circumstance is. We thank you for this. We remember your glorious work now on the cross as we observe the wonder of it. Praying all this by means of Jesus our Lord.